Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Council of the University of Melbourne, it gives me very great pleasure indeed to welcome you all to today's graduation ceremony. I begin in our customary way with an acknowledgement of the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the land on which this ceremony will take place. May I add a special word of welcome to Professor Ian Young, and to members and supporters of the Menzies Foundation. Today's ceremony will have several parts. First, we will have certification and presentation of the PhD candidates. We will then have the presentation of four recipients of the Chancellor's Prize for Excellence <laughs> in the PhD theses for 2015, and we'll present the candidates with their medallions. We will then move to the Sir Robert Menzies Oration on <coughs> Higher Education for 2015. The Menzies Oration is an important event, both to this university and for higher education in Australia. The University of Melbourne is proud of its association with the Menzies name and the long line of distinguished speakers who have delivered this oration over the years. <coughs> We are delighted that in 2015 this great tradition will be continued by the Vice-Chancellor of the Australian <coughs> National University, Professor Ian Young. But before we come to the oration, we have other most important work to do. The conferring of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy on a group of outstanding candidates from several faculties and schools of the university. To each and every one of you who are graduating, may I offer my sincere congratulations for your achievements are truly outstanding. And to those here who have supported any of these candidates as parents or relatives, partner or friend, I thank you on behalf of the university. To supporters and candidates together, I encourage you to view today's conferring ceremony as an acknowledgement and celebration of your joint efforts. 
Though most of us have attended conferrings before today, it is appropriate to mention the important values expressed by the ceremony. Those values are essentially the same as those contained in the University of Melbourne's first ceremony over 160 years ago. Essentially, the ceremony reflects the importance of academic freedom, fearless inquiry, and an uncompromising quest for excellence. Those are values that you, the candidates, have embodied in your work, and I'm confident that each of you will continue to uphold them as graduates in the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Once more, to our distinguished guests, graduates and supporters, thank you for being here and welcome. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Council of the University, I shall confer the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Medicine. I call on Professor Nils Olikens, Vice President of the Academic Board. Chancellor, I certify to you and to the University that the candidates now to be presented have fulfilled the conditions prescribed for admission to the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Medicine, and are entitled to be admitted to the rank, privileges, and responsibilities of those degrees. By virtue of the authority committed to me, I shall present candidates a certificate of admission to the degree, and by so doing, shall admit them to the rank, privileges, and responsibilities of those degrees. I will now receive the candidates for admission to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Medicine. I call again on Professor Olikens. Chancellor, I present to you these candidates for admission to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Gregory Damon Armstrong, who investigated the high level of suicidality amongst people who inject drugs in Delhi, India. He identified psychological and social risk factors for suicidal thoughts and attempts and observed that suicidality was associated with increased health risk behaviours. His findings have important implications for suicide and HIV prevention interventions. Gregory Damon Armstrong. Yason Baldus, who examined theories of neutrino mass, the origin of the cosmological matter-antimatter asymmetry, and the nature of dark matter. In particular, he developed a new mechanism for simultaneously producing an excess of ordinary matter over antimatter and dark matter over dark antimatter. Yason Baldus. Athena Bellis, who explored the feminist potential of contemporary teen screen revisions of traditional literary fairy tales. These postmodern media forms feature empowered adolescent heroines who actively oppose their subordinate objectified position within adult patriarchal culture, a resistance that reinscribes the feminine rite of passage narrative with renewed agency. Athena Bellis. Petra Buskins, who completed a study of the conflict between modern motherhood and ideals of the autonomous self, tracing a history from the early modern period to today. She examined how maternal absence reconstructs gender dynamics in the home. This research will assist in understanding how to develop gender equality after parenthood. Petra Buskins.
Indrajit Hazarika, who analysed key influences on the international migration, recruitment and integration of medical graduates using comparative analysis of outcomes in five major host countries. His study, by exploring the trends and presenting new information, advances the understanding of the multi-level forces driving migration of international medical graduates. Indrajit Hazarika. Patricia Ann Kinraid, who examined the experiences of carers and adult patients with chronic kidney disease. She found that many of the patients and caregivers used emotion-focused coping strategies and social supports to maintain their quality of life. Her study has important implications for couple-based interventions with these patients and carers. Tricia Ann Kinraid. Paul Aaron Knight, who developed the hypoallergenic forms of a major allergenic protein of ryegrass for the potential development of safer reagents for the treatment of hay fever and allergic asthma. His study showed that conformational epitope mapping and computational protein structure modelling can be combined to design novel allergy immunotherapy reagents. Paul Aaron Knight. James Michael Labar, who studied the role of social investment amongst the causes of bipolar disorders. He found that the motivation to prestige was elevated in the bipolar disorders and proposed a model for this. This research furthers the understanding of these disorders at a basic and psychological level. James Michael Labar. Xiao Gang Liu, who studied spectral properties of Cayley graphs, spectra of graph operations, and graphs determined by their spectra. He obtained a number of mathematical results on these topics that are significant contributions to spectral graph theory and will have potential applications to mathematical chemistry. Xiao Gang Liu. Marie Liesnianin, who studied the system properties of control systems which use a communication network as a communication medium to send or receive control-related data. The study improves our theoretical and practical understanding of the stability, robustness and controllability of these systems with respect to scheduling and information loss issues. Marie Liesnianin. Anita Margaret Morris, who studied children's safety and resilience in the context of family violence. Through interviews with children and mothers, she found that children lack a voice and must negotiate their safety. Her study argues for early intervention responses to children and their mothers in the primary care setting. Anita Margaret Morris. Aini Nazura Paimin Abdul Halim, who examined the roles of learning strategy, interest and intention as predictors of success amongst students studying engineering. She found that intention is the most important indicator for success. This understanding will allow engineering schools to develop better strategies to assist their students to achieve academic success. Aini Nazura Paimin Abdul Halim.
Alicia Rosetto, who studied how members of the public provide support to people with a mental illness. She found considerable gaps in the mental health first aid skills of the public and developed a model of helping behaviour that can be used to improve mental health first aid training. Alicia Rosetto. John Hua Seng Ting, who investigated how indigenous and migrant practices influence colonial architecture, focusing on the 19th century timber forts of the Brook Rajas in northwest Borneo. He found that the fort's design, procurement and implementation hybridised modern naval and prefabrication methods with local architectural construction and material approaches. John Hua Seng Ting. Hannah Kate Vanyoy, who investigated the role of a protein-regulated chromatin conformation and gene expression uh, during craniofacial, heart and aortic arch development. The findings increase our understanding of the molecular role of this protein and environmental factors in the pathogenesis of congenital heart and aortic arch defects, as well as craniofacial dysgenesis. Hannah Kate Vanyoy. Gordon Francis Welcome Wilcock, who examined the construction of national identity in Pakistan under President Musharraf, 1999 to 2008. He showed that while Musharraf promoted a discourse of enlightened moderation, he continued the practice of promoting unitary official nationalism that failed to adequately recognise or accommodate Pakistan's ethno-linguistically and religiously differentiated population. Gordon Francis Welcome Wilcock. Agnieszka Wojewska Klauser, who investigated physiological and biochemical responses of acacia and eucalyptus seedlings under drought and heat wave conditions. She discovered differences in antioxidant defense mechanisms between trees adapted to contrasting habitats that helped to explain why trees from humid habitats may be more sensitive to drought and heat stress. Agnieszka Wojewska Klauser. Chancellor, I present to you this candidate for admission to the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Kapil Seti, who compared the effects of cobalt ions and low oxygen on human renal cancer cells and on the rat kidney. His discovery that treatment with cobalt ions decreases kidney damage in rats following oxygen deprivation may in the future benefit patients undergoing renal surgery. Kapil Seti. in absentia candidates. Chancellor. I certify to you and to the university that the candidates whose names are included on this list have fulfilled the conditions prescribed for admission to the awards severally set out and are entitled to be admitted in absentia to the rank, privileges and responsibilities of those awards. I admit these candidates in, absent, in absentia to the rank, privileges and responsibility of the awards severally set out.
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the presentation of degrees. I now call again on Professor Oliphants to present the recipients of the Chancellor's Prize for 2015. Chancellor, I am delighted to present to you the recipients of the Chancellor's Prize for 2015. The recipients were selected from over 500 completed Doctors of Philosophy in 2014, and these awards reflect outstanding work in their respective disciplines. In the humanities and creative arts, Geoffrey Mead, who studied the origins and uses of the concept of habitus at the centre of the work of French sociologist Pierre Budeau. The dissertation offers the first work totally devoted to Bordeaux's concept and shows how it remained deeply marked by his studies of the consciousness of time among rural Algerians. This has resulted in a peculiar but highly valuable approach to sociological inquiry, where the researcher is obliged to take people's subjective consciousness into full account alongside objective social facts. Geoffrey Mead. Wendy Erng, whose thesis critically examined the Chinese anti-monopoly law from a political economy perspective. She filled a clear gap in the Western-oriented literature and made a highly original contribution, moving away from a doctrinal approach. This theoretically sophisticated and rigorously informed thesis reveals how the contrasting interests and objectives of stakeholders influence the drafting and implementation of the law. The findings and conclusions will be significant in shaping the thinking of researchers, practitioners, and officials in this field. Wendy Ern. <laughs> Liam Teres Hall, whose thesis bridged the quantum bio divide in order to understand how the quantum properties of the nitrogen vacancy, NV, center in diamond can be used as an ultra-sensitive probe capable of detecting the minute magnetic signals from individual atoms and molecules in biological environments. His research has opened a fundamental and new window on basic biological functions in a range of important problems, from cellular biology and nanomedicine to drug discovery and neuroscience. Liam Teres Holt. In medicine, dentistry, and health sciences, Ong Ko Win, who investigated cancer risks for people with colorectal cancer predisposing genetic mutations. He established how best to identify people with DNA repair gene mutations and the most accurate cancer risks. His research will guide personalised management for cancer treatment and prevention. His thesis comprised nine peer-reviewed publications, including Journal of Clinical Oncology. He has been invited to present his research work at 12 leading international research institutions and was the recipient of the Victorian Premier's Award for Health and Medical Research in 2013. Ong Ko Win. Ladies and gentlemen, I now call on Mr. Brian Doyle AM, Chairman of the Menzies Foundation. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, Professor Young, Mr. Alec Menzies, Ms. Diana Menzies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Menzies Foundation, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this, the 24th Sir Robert Menzies Oration on Higher Education. Sir Robert Menzies retired in 1966 as Australia's distinguished and longest serving Prime Minister. 
In reflecting on his achievements for Australia, he considered that his contribution to the development of universities would prove to be amongst the most lasting and most important. In recognition of his vision and leadership and to strengthen the role of higher education in Australia, the University of Melbourne and the Menzies Foundation established the Menzies Oration in 1991. It's especially fitting that these annual Menzies orations are held in partnership with this university, where Robert Menzies, as a leading law student, was president of the Students' Representative Council in 1916, and where he served as university chancellor in his mature years. The Menzies Foundation honours Sir Robert Menzies' contribution to education through a series of postgraduate scholarships in allied health, engineering and law. Other initiatives include a postdoctoral R.G. Menzies Fellowship offered in partnership with the NH and MRC and Menzies Postgraduate Scholarships to Harvard in partnership with the Harvard Club of Australia and the Australian National University. In 2014, the Menzies Foundation initiated undergraduate scholarships to rural Victorian students for tertiary study in partnership with the Fielding Foundation. Ormond College has now joined this partnership for the next three years. For over 30 years, the Menzies Foundation has played a strong role in providing funds and support for health and medical research around the country, starting with the establishment of the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin in 1984, followed by the Menzies Institute for Medical Research in Hobart and the Menzies Centre for Health Policy in Sydney and Canberra. Earlier this year, the Menzies Health Institute Queensland was launched in partnership with Griffith University. Through its scholarships and through its investments in health research, the Menzies Foundation works to inspire and nurture Australia's future leaders. This annual Menzies oration provides an opportunity for the Menzies Foundation and the University to join with their guests and the orator to celebrate excellence in higher education. The Foundation believes investment in higher education is essential to providing Australia with the skills to be internationally competitive through this 21st century. Today, we're extremely fortunate that Professor Ian Young, AO, has agreed to deliver this year's Menzies Oration. Professor Young is a recognised leader in higher education, and we look forward to his address with particular anticipation. I thank Mr Doyle for his address about the work of the Menzies Foundation and its relationship to this university. I now call on Professor Davis to introduce Professor Ian Young, who will deliver the 2015 Sir Robert Menzies Oration on Higher Education entitled Australia, a Knowledge Future. Chancellor, to deliver the 2015 Sir Robert Menzies Oration on Higher Education, it's a delight to welcome warmly a distinguished Australian academic leader whose background lies in engineering and technology. Educated at James Cook University in Townsville, Ian Young has served as a professor at the Australian Defence Force Academy, an executive dean and pro-vice chancellor at the University of Adelaide, and the vice chancellor and president of Swinburne University of Technology. His many academic distinctions include the C.N. Barton Medal and the Lorentz Straub Award. Ian's particular research interests lies in coastal and ocean engineering and physical oceanography. Among many consultancies as an academic, he's worked with the US Navy and the offshore oil and gas industry in both Asia and North America. In March 2011, Ian was appointed Vice-Chancellor and President of the Australian National University, a role he has performed with distinction. In 2014, he was elected and remains the chair of the Group of Eight Board of Directors. During a very difficult period, Ian has provided superb leadership to that group as well. As his term concludes at the ANU at the end of this year, 
Ian will return to his research passions in a research position at Swinburne University. Ian is a prominent and important voice in the wider higher education and research debate in Australia, so it is a great pleasure to invite him to deliver the 2015 Sir Robert Menzies Oration on Higher Education. Please welcome Professor Ian Young. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, Chair of the Menzies Foundation, members of the university community, can I begin by firstly thanking you for the great honour of being asked to deliver the Menzies Oration at a university with a remarkable history and a critically important role to play in the development of our nation. Indeed, the role great universities can and should play in shaping the future of nation will be central to my comments today. It is widely acknowledged that Sir Robert Menzies played a major role in the development of the Australian higher education system. When Menzies came to power in 1939, there were six universities and 14,000 students. By the time he retired in 1966, this had grown to 16 universities and 90,000 students. Between 1955 and 1966, funding for universities increased tenfold. Menzies himself saw his contribution in this regard as significant. Speaking here at the University of Melbourne in 1965, he said, my, lo my life has devoted itself for years to the development of education in this country. He also indicated that his government marked, and I quote, the beginning of a new revolution in the university world. Menzies also appreciated the important role universities should play in research. Whilst in opposition in 1945, Menzies stated that the research aspect of university work needs to be brought into the very forefront of our educational thinking. It is this research element of universities I wish to explore further. As I am sure the audience will appreciate, Australia presently faces challenging economic times. After more than a decade of dependence on the investment phase of the mining boom, slowing Chinese growth and declining resources prices have ended what economist Ross Garno termed Australia's salad days. A period of budget surplus, repeated tax cuts and increasing middle class welfare. A period where the high Australian dollar, high labour costs and declining productivity have cut a sway through Australian manufacturing. After a 2014-15 federal budget deficit of $41 billion, the deficit for 2015-16, in the current financial year, is forecast to be around $35 billion. Based on Treasury figures, the budget will return to surplus in 2019-20. However, speaking at the Crawford Australian Leadership Forum at ANU earlier this year, Former Treasury Secretary Martin Parkinson cast doubt over these budget forecasts, warning that the nation's economic outlook is more precarious, significantly more precarious, than either political party would like to admit. As he and other commentators have pointed out, the 2019-20 budget surplus is predicated on, an econo on the economy returning to trend GDP growth of 3.5%. He indicated that the assumption that the economy was, and I quote, just going through a rough patch may be very optimistic. Further, he noted that seven of the last eight years saw GDP below potential. As a result, he concluded that economic growth may be headed for a new norm of somewhere between 2.75 and 3%, raising real doubts about whether coming years would deliver enough revenue to balance the budget. Ross Garno, in his book, Dog Days, raises similar concerns and focuses on the need for Australia to significantly enhance productivity if we are to maintain living standards close to what we are used to. Now, of course, economists trade on pessimism. As a non-economist, I find it interesting that the public debate about solving these budget challenges seems to focus largely on what I would call narrow monetary solutions, tax and tax changes, and fiscal restraint. What about the developing industries that will power our wealth in the future? 
When we do look at our industrial base, it tends largely to be a look in the rear vision mirror, enhancing our coal, mineral, education and agricultural exports. Of course, these traditional industries are important and they'll remain important for many years to come, but all have their challenges and there are a few nations we would want to compare ourselves with which would ideally build an economy with such a mix. So what should Australia's economy be built on if we want an affluent, egalitarian, socially cohesive, modern society? Perhaps it would be good to look for exemplars in the major economic powers of North America and Europe, namely the United States and Germany. To this group, one could add smaller economies such as Scandinavia and Canada and emerging economies such as China. However, for simplicity, I will look just at the US and Germany. These are industrialised countries and much of their wealth has been built on high technology manufacturing. Moreover, they have been able to manufacture sought-after exports in societies with a relatively high cost base, certainly in Germany. Here, technology is key to success. It is telling to look at the investments made by these countries and compare these with Australia. Germany and the United States have a gross expenditure on research and development of 2.85 and 2.73% of GDP respectively, considerably larger than the official 2.13% for Australia. More telling is where this expenditure occurs. Gross R&D expenditure can occur in a number of places, in government, in universities, in industry, etc. The business expenditure on R&D in the United States is 1.98%, Germany 1.93%, and in Australia just 1.24% of GDP. That is, Australia spends only about 60% as much in industry on R&D. We see the same trend if we look at the number of PhD qualified people working in industry. Germany, 20 per 1,000, the United States, 11 per 1,000, and Australia, just eight per 1,000. Now, these numbers should not be news to anyone. It's well publicised that interaction between industry and universities in Australia is poor. In fact, we rank last, 33 out of 33 countries in the OECD. This does not bode well if we're hoping that high value-add technology-based industries may help us address the looming budget challenges. I'll come back to the reasons for this a little later. The flip side of these numbers is the research expenditure in universities and government, and principally universities. And here, Australia does better. Germany, 0.95%, United States, 0.75%, and Australia, 0.88% of GDP. The numbers are comparable, and we often comment on the fact that our universities rank well internationally and that we punch above our weight in research. The chief scientist, Ian Chubb, has, however, given us reason to temper our enthusiasm. The Office of the Chief Scientist has analysed scientific publication data. They looked at both measures of publication volume, that is, publications per capita, and measures of publication quality, citations per publication or citation rate. Both of these numbers are above the world average, hence the comment that we punch above our weight. However, as Professor Chubb points out in his own style, it would be worth looking at who is in our weight class. The world average is biased low because of the many emerging nations, particularly in Asia. Our citation rate is in fact below the European average, Germany, Norway, Belgium, Canada, Finland, Great Britain, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, and particularly the United States, all rank above Australia. Our volume of publications is fine, but there is a question over the quality. Results of the 2012 Excellence in Research Australia, or ERA assessment, provide greater insight into these numbers, as they're essentially based on the same data used by the chief scientist. The ERA analysis shows that 70% of the research areas ranked four, that is, above world average, or five, well above world average, are concentrated in just eight of our 39 universities, the so-called group of eight. That is, there is excellent research conducted in Australia, but there is also a considerable tail. 
In a sense, this outcome is not surprising when we consider how Australia funds research across our universities. My estimate is that each year the federal government spends about $5.5 billion on research in our universities. This number is made up of about $0.9 billion for each of the ARC and NHMRC, $1.77 billion for research block grants, and finally, and perhaps controversially, approximately $1.95 billion, which is the cross-subsidy from teaching revenue to research. This cost subsidy has been widely discussed as part of the fee deregulation debate over the last 12 months. I've calculated it by assuming that 30% of the Commonwealth grant scheme, or CGS funding, supplied by the Commonwealth on a per-student basis is used for research. Clearly, this figure can be debated, but it is the number arrived at by the DUA committee established by the Commonwealth to advise on some of the elements of the fee deregulation package. The issue here is that much of our research funding is not distributed based on demonstrable research quality. Rather, it's distributed on the basis of research volume or on the number of undergraduate students, which is not related to research in any way at all. The ARC and the NHMRC grants are peer reviewed through a rigorous process. I believe this is of the highest quality and allocates project funding to areas and researchers of world quality. However, much of our research block grants are distributed on volume measures. The number of publications, the number of higher degree students and the rate at which they complete, the volume of research dollars received by an institution. The advent of ERA and the Sustainable Research Excellence or SRE funding which it drives was intended to address these very issues. However, SRE has now been cut or delayed three times over the last few years and assuming no more cuts, which may be a brave thought, it may eventually reach $300 million. That is 17% of the research block grants and only 5% of my total estimate of the research spend by the Commonwealth. My concern is that we don't target our research investment in areas of demonstrable excellence and hence our average research performance trails our international peers certainly the United States and Germany, that I used as comparators. So what do these nations do? Starting in 2005, Germany commenced its Excellence Initiative. A total of $5.3 billion is being invested in three rounds to enhance research at German universities. This funding has been quite concentrated. In the final round, just 11 universities of excellence were selected for focused funding. The funding was awarded based on clear plans for growth and excellence. Germany also has a tradition of defining disciplines of importance, often in its core advanced manufacturing areas for focused differential funding. Now the US system is quite different, with both government and philanthropic funding playing a significant role in supporting university research. Unlike Australia, US competitive grants include full on costs. These costs are allocated as part of the grant rather than indirectly through block grants. This means that there is greater research funding concentration than in Australia. Philanthropic funding also tends to be concentrated in the top US institutions. One may feel that Harvard and Stanford already have endowments which are sufficiently large. However, this does not stop their alumni continuing to give to their respective alma mater. People like to invest in demonstrable strength. Other countries have followed similar research concentration strategies. For instance, China with its 211 and 985 strategies to build a relatively small group of elite universities. And the United Kingdom, which through its repeated research excellence processes has concentrated research funding in a selective group of institutions. One has to ask if Australia's more egalitarian approach represents good use of scarce research funding and whether it yields the country the best outcomes. The data would question whether it does. But let me come back to the main theme of this speech. It's not actually about funding research excellence, but building economic prosperity for this country. My argument is, however, that to do that, to build the high technology industries, Australia needs to remain an affluent nation in the face of almost certain decline of our traditional industries, 
firstly requires world-leading basic research. This is not simply the wish of a university vice-chancellor. The evidence supports this view. Comparable nations which have built the types of economies we will need in the future recognise this, invest accordingly, and have built prosperous industrially-based economies. Now, great basic research may be a precursor to industrial affluence, but by itself, it's not enough. Of course, what is required to kickstart innovation in Australia has been debated for many years. Commonly, it's seen as a problem of our universities. We do great research, but we can't collaborate with industry. As I've just discussed, perhaps our basic research is not as great as we often claim. What about collaboration with industry? The data is clear. Our collaboration with industry is poor, but why? We commonly hear that the incentive structures in our universities don't support industry-relevant research, that we value peer-reviewed basic research, national competitive grants, era assessments, and hence our promotion and reward structures drive our staff and institutions accordingly. Although I agree that Australian universities can do much more to enhance our industry interaction and provide the appropriate incentives, I am not convinced the answer is so simple. I have worked in institutions in both Germany and the United States. Although there are differences with the Australian system, I do not believe the basic drivers and incentives are fundamentally different. I am convinced that incentive structures are not the whole answer, and changing things like the formulas which drive block grants allocations will have little to no impact. Let's look for a moment at the industries with which Australian universities might interact. The European Union <coughs> Industrial Scorecard lists the R&D investment by companies around the world. Based on the 2012 scorecard, Toyota is the largest R&D, has the largest R&D spend in the world at approximately $11.7 billion per year. Australia has only nine companies in the top 1,000. Telstra is the highest ranked Australian company at number 125 in the world with a spend of a little over $1 billion. After this, the magnitude of the R&D spend trails away quickly. The, reality, the reality is that even if Australian universities are keen to collaborate with industry, there is very little Australian industry with an interest or a need for research input. Now, this is not surprising. As I've stated earlier, we simply do not have an economy which is structured in a way that needs such research collaboration with universities. So do we have little high technology industry because of the inability of our universities to collaborate and commercialise their research? Or do we have little research collaboration because there is little high technology industry? Clearly a circular argument. Other issues are almost certainly at play here. The truth is we have not needed to build a high technology manufacturing sector. We have historically been able to build an affluent society by exploiting our natural resources, agricultural initially, and in more recent times, mining. I think there are also additional broader societal factors at play. Here, comparisons with the United States and Germany are again interesting. Compared with the US, we are clearly much less entrepreneurial, and risk-taking is far less acceptable in Australian society. The US free enterprise focus rewards risk takers. This means that the US has both a more entrepreneurial culture, a positive, but also far greater disparities of wealth, a negative compared to Australia. One can't use this same argument with Germany, with its strong social security system and apparently much weaker incentive structures for risk taking and entrepreneurship. I recently accompanied the Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann, on a trade delegation to Germany, a country where I lived and worked for almost three years. The thing that struck me in the many meetings with industry, government and universities was the high degree of collaboration in German society. This begins at the political level, where consensus politics is the norm in the German system. It also, however, permeates industry. The German cluster system seems to involve remarkable collaboration, not just between industry and university, but between industries. 
The system is highly focused, building clusters of real scale in areas clearly focused on the industrial future of the nation. Areas such as biotech, silicon and solar, aviation, automotive, software and carbon and composites have not been chosen arbitrarily. The level of genuine collaboration between industry partners was remarkable. I doubt this would occur in Australia, where I suspect intellectual property issues would prevail. The same observation could also be made about U German universities. Acceptance of differential funding through programs like the Excellence Initiative seems greater than I would expect in Australia. There is a recognition that building excellence in major clusters has a benefit for the whole nation. Now, I would not be so presumptuous to believe that I have a recipe that could provide Australia with a, with a high technology manufacturing future. However, I believe the points outlined previously do provide some guidance which we should carefully consider. Let me try and summarise the issues. Firstly, I believe that Australia needs truly world-leading basic research. Noting that the conversion rate between research breakthrough and viable industry is low, we need a long stream of world-leading original technology flowing from our research laboratories. We can't expect to be able to adopt other nations' technologies. Increasingly, we need the world to lead the world in breakthrough science. The differences between good science and great science is significant. The major industries of the future will increasingly come from cutting-edge breakthroughs. I do not believe we can expect such science to develop at scale without funding focused on clear excellence. Now, this could be achieved in a number of ways. My preference would be an excellence initiative which identified a small number of institutions and differentially funded these institutions. Although institutional autonomy is important, I believe the reality is that funding would need to be quite targeted. As I noted earlier, I do not believe we presently spend our research funding in the most effective manner. However, the political reality is that any attempt to reallocate the existing funding would lead to a fractious debate of university against university, region against city, etc. Therefore, I believe new funding would be required for this purpose. As I've indicated, existing levels of research funding within Australia are not generous by international standards. There is an argument for additional funding. It must be at scale, it must be focused, and it must build world-class research. Now, I appreciate that this is a time of fiscal restraint. However, we elect leaders to lead. This is a time when our leaders need to do exactly that. To identify a vision for the future industries of Australia and to invest in the underpinning science to enable that vision. Secondly, I believe it's a requirement to achieve the sort of change envisaged through a broad social and political consensus. A consensus that sees Australia developing such a high technology future and that it will be in the best interests of the whole country. This requires broad recognition that great research underpins the future of the nation and that it is our, to our collective benefit to invest in that future and to see our world-leading research generate industrial outputs for the nation. This consensus would need to span all levels of society, political, business, academia, and the general public. A good example of such commitment would be the Obama 2013 State of the Nation speech. As he spoke before a hostile Congress, the President said, in a few weeks, I will be sending a budget to Congress that helps us meet that goal. And the goal he was speaking about was a prosperous future. We'll invest in biomedical research, information technology, and especially clean energy technology, an investment that will strengthen our security, protect our planet, and create countless new jobs for our people. Imagine if Australia had bipartisan political views similar to these. But such views would need to go further. They would also need to capture groups such as the BCA, the Business Council of Australia. At present, too many of our business leaders see universities as training providers for future employees, but not as, knowledge, not as a knowledge resource to build new industries. 
Now, perhaps I'm politically naive, I'm sure I am, but the opportunity and the reasons for driving such change seem compelling. A consensus like this would also require a recognition that the industries of today will not be those of tomorrow, and that we need to take active steps to position the country to be a leader in emerging technologies. This will be uncomfortable. Change often is. A good example of such technological change is the present debate on renewable energy. As the Vice-Chancellor said when he introduced me, I am both a technologist and an environmental scientist. One of my research interests is the role that the oceans play in climate change. As such, I am confident in the science of global warming and believe that anthropogenic climate change is the single greatest challenge presently facing humanity. I also believe it is an issue which will be solved by technology. Alternative and renewable energy will eventually become so cost-effective that it will simply sweep expensive carbon-based solutions away. My own view is it's not a question of will this happen, rather when will it happen. Prices on carbon and renewable energy targets will make it happen earlier. There is good reason to make it happen as soon as possible as the damage being done to our climate will take centuries to address. We may be running out of time. As such, I support a debate on emissions trading, carbon prices and renewable energy targets. However, if we met our renewable energy target by importing German, US and Chinese wind turbines and solar panels, I would be most disappointed. Until recently, a significant number of the Chinese and US solar panels actually used Australian technology. But we now seem to be seeing such technology as a threat to our coal industry, and hence a research area we should not encourage. Renewable energy is an example of one of those step changes in technology that disrupts the political and social structure of the world. It could result in the existing industrially strong nations reinforcing their strength. It is, however, an opportunity for new players to build the new technology that would represent a major disruption to the economic order. A clear example of where Australia could take a leadership position and support the development of a major Australian industry built on excellent Australian research. The third element, which I believe will be important, is the social licence for individuals and companies to prosper and build major industries. This goes to the issues of risk and reward and building an entrepreneurial society. As I indicated earlier, these new industries will need to be built on the back of world-class basic research largely funded by government, that is, by the taxpayer. Industry needs to understand this. If they do not, I doubt they will acquire the social licence to achieve the technological future described. As any economist will tell us, Business builds wealth in society. Successful businesses create employment, pay taxes, and underpin a modern society. That society has to believe, however, the system is fair. In a system where business more and more leverages from the investment of government, we need to be diligent to ensure the public-private contributions and benefits remain balanced. The narrative around this risk and reward equation will be important to developing the social licence which celebrates entrepreneurs rather than denigrates them. We all know the odium of the White Shoe Brigade of the 70s and 80s. Building a culture where society sees business giving back will be important. Approaches such as enhanced corporate philanthropy and more industry support in the form of loans perhaps even income contingent loans, rather than direct government handouts, will go a long way to changing Australian society, to developing the new structures required to build a more entrepreneurial society. As I said at the outset, Australia faces a challenging period. We do, however, still have a solid base to build from. As many of my European colleagues still comment, they wish they had Australia's challenges. That said, our traditional industries must change. They will not disappear overnight, which does enable an ordered approach to our future. Our university system is a great strength of this nation. It is a system which has been resilient and innovative, 
After all, it has built one of the major export industries of this country, international education. My view is it could underpin another, a high technology future in which we transition from depending on the natural wealth of our land to the intellectual wealth of our people. I do not accept that as a nation, we don't have the ability, the desire and the drive to do exactly that. Australia has innovated in the past, it can do so again. I believe it's time for us to seriously question how we make such a transition, how we do this at scale and how we use it to underpin our economy, how we do this in a way which will build broad consensus. As Menzies said, these things call for a spirit of adventure. They call for a desire to contribute a rising level of civic unselfishness. Thank you. On your behalf, ladies and gentlemen, I thank Professor Ian Young for <coughs> delivering, delivering the oration, so thank you. I now invite Mr Alex Menzies, who is representing the Menzies family, to present the commemorative medallion to Professor Young. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the proceedings of the degree conferring ceremony and the 2015 Sir Robert Menzies Oration on Higher Education. On behalf of the university, thank you for joining us today to celebrate this very special occasion. Thank you.